morning, everybody. Um, so this is a little different from what I normally do. I teach a lot of classes. I do a lot of hands-on demos. I don't do a lot of things with presentations. So um, I have a lot of pictures, pretty pictures of food. And uh, hopefully, I'll remember to advance through them. Um, but if, I, if you get tired of looking at something, just give me a, a wave, and I'll give you the next picture. Um, but so let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to do this. And, um, and first, I'm just going to say, it's all entirely accidental, I, you know, as, as much of life is. I, um, for the last 10 years, I have been writing a website called Food in Jars. And I started that because I, um, had been a, I had been the editor of a site called Slash Food, which was AOL's um, food blog back, way back in the day, and gotten really invested in the food blogging community and thought, you know, uh, when that job was ending, I wanted to stay involved in that community, and so I thought I'd start my own food blog, not thinking it was turning into a job, not really even knowing that much about food preservation. Just simply, I liked jars. I knew a little bit about canning, and I thought it would be a good fit for me. And, um, and boy, has it turned out to be. Um, so backing up, uh, so I grew up on the West Coast. I grew up in Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon. And my parents were definitely of good hippie stock. Um, my mom learned to can in the 70s in Santa Cruz. And um, when I was growing up, they would kind of moved away from that a little bit, but because we always lived in places that had either fruit trees or berry bushes, we always did a little canning during my childhood. Um, I also came from a family where, you know, preservation just generally was kind of our MO. We were thrift store shoppers. Um, we lived in old houses. Um, there was this, you know, ethos of, you know, making things work and um, preserving what you have and appreciating the past. And, um, and so that's kind of where I came from. And so fast forward, I was living in Philadelphia. And this was about 13 years ago. I went blueberry picking with a friend one day in South Jersey. And if, has anyone ever been blueberry picking before? OK. Um, when you go blueberry picking, it's really easy to pick a lot without really knowing that that's what you've done. You know, um, it, you can, you, you're in the field, you've got a bucket, it doesn't seem like that much, and then suddenly you go to pay and you've um, got 13 pounds of blueberries. And, um, and I, I live in an apartment that has been in my family for 55 years, and um, it has an 80 square foot kitchen. And so bringing the, these 13 pounds of blueberries back to my 80 square foot kitchen, I went, oh my god, what, do I, what am I going to do with all of these? And I, well, I thought I'll freeze some, you know, maybe I'll make a pie. But the thing that the kind of early conditioning kicked in, and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make some jam. And so this was kind of my first instance of preserving food at home by myself. So I called my mom um, out in Portland. I got an over the phone refresher course. I ran out to a hardware store and I bought like four jars. And I came home and I made my first batch of jam. And there was something about it that really clicked and resonated for me. Um, I loved the activity of doing it, but more, I loved the act of preserving. I loved the idea that I would get to enjoy, I would get to reap the pleasure and the benefits of this day, this one day of picking fruit and then making jam for a longer period of time, that I would get to re-experience those joys, that day of being in the field with a friend, um, this experience of calling my mom, and then of making that jam. And so that spoke to me. That larger food preservation experience really spoke to me. And so I started doing more of it. I started to think, well, what else can I can? You know, if I can can blueberries, what else can I do? And, um, and that was kind of how it all started. Now, I do think that, you know, my childhood plays a big role in that. Growing up in Los Angeles, you know, there's that kind of Meyer lemons grow everywhere. We had plum trees. And I always appreciated that sense of abundance that comes when you have a lot. Oh, see, I'm forgetting to advance my slides. <laughs> no one reminded me. Um, um, I always really appreciated the kind of sense of abundance that you get from fruit trees, from gardens. Like, it really resonated and clicked for me. And, um, and of course, I was also a kid who was reading like Laura Ingalls Wilder books and watching Little House on the Prairie. So there was also this element of like feeling like Laura and helping Ma when I was a kid that, you know, anyone else have that? OK, thank you. I'm not alone. Um, and so as I got older and as I started um, doing more and more with food preservation, 
I really found that it was something that was like something I loved and wanted to explore more. So when it came time to start my own food blog, you know, starting something called Food in Jars seemed a little bit more um, natural for me. But I didn't expect it was going to take me to the places it has. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about why canning and preserving really does speak to me and where it's taken me. Like there is this sense of abundance that comes when you have a full pantry and when you've had a hand in doing it yourself, it's very satisfying, it's very um, enjoyable and pleasurable and there's also that sense of wealth that comes from having food that you've made yourself where you know, even if your bank account is low, you can at least turn to the pantry and know that you have something and also it becomes um, currency in some cases. Over the last eight years, I've helped um, run the Philadelphia Food Swaps, and it's a great way to take what I've made and trade it with other people and turn it into different things, which is very satisfying. Um, as I started doing more and more food preservation, one of the things I learned was that, and one of the reasons I, as I did more reading about this, the reason I think that it resonated so deeply for me is that we as humans don't have to make anything to survive anymore. You know, it used to be that we had to make everything to survive, right? We had to, um, you know, grow all of our food and weave fabric and make clothes. And um, certainly I don't think I want to go back to a time where I have to do all of those things. But I feel like as humans, we are hungry for that little bit of connection, that desire to make something. You know, we don't need to make everything, but it's also no good to make nothing. And so for me, food preservation really satisfied that kind of internal yearning to make something, have some hand in what, um, what I was eating for, in my household. And I find that making jam, making pickles, doing um, 150 pounds of tomatoes at the end of each summer, although I don't know if you guys have noticed, that's not happening this year. I'm seven months pregnant with twins and I'm due in August, so. Um, <laughs> There will not be 150 pounds of tomatoes being canned in my kitchen this year, um, but in the past years, that's what I've done. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting about food preservation is that it, is a, it was a skill that was almost lost. It is something that has really come back in the last 10 years, but it wasn't, it, there are so many people who come to me and say, you know, my grandmother canned, but she died before I had a chance to learn from her. Or, um, you know, my, I, I, I have a neighbor who does this, but I don't really feel comfortable asking them. And really and truly, what happened over the last, um, you know, 60 to 70 years was a lot having to do with the, after World War II, there were a lot of munitions factories that needed to have a role and became food pro food production factories. And so there was this big marketing campaign in the late 40s and 50s designed to get people to stop canning and stop preserving food so that you would buy it instead of doing it yourself. And, um, and so we lost things like community canning kitchens, we lost the knowledge base, people moved away from it. And there was also this fear campaign that was um, launched by a lot of these food manufacturers where they talked about how their food was hygienic and home canning wasn't, that home canning was dangerous. And I find it really interesting that so much of what's happening now is people want to reclaim that sense of it's not dangerous and I can do this very safely and have that role in their food again. So back to how I got here. I, um, so I started Food in Jars, the website, 10 years ago, not realizing that I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. You know, often we start a project thinking, well, you know, I know plenty to do this. And um, I put myself out there on the internet as someone who was writing about canning and preserving and very quickly learned that um, I needed to learn a lot more. And so I spent a lot of time um, reading and taking classes and um, doing crazy things like reading the FDA guidelines for home or for commercial food producers because there's a lot that you can do in a commercial setting that you weren't supposed to do in a home setting. And I was like, why is this? Why can't we um, do the things and do the things at home that they say you can do in a commercial setting? So I did a lot of crazy um, research. And just at the time that I started Food in Jars, the recession hit in 2008 and 2009. And so suddenly people were looking for information about canning and preserving and I happened to be there. And so um, I got a lot of traffic and a lot of attention in that period of time because I was the person on the internet writing about food preservation. Um, from there, the opportunity to write my book, first book, book came along and about um, eight months before that book came out, I got laid off from my full-time job. So it was this perfect opportunity to just kind of go for it. 
And since then, I have continued to, you know, just kind of has continued to build. And so I have now written four books and I've been teaching and traveling all over the country for the last um, like eight years doing this full time. So that's a little bit about how I got here and the, a little background about food preservation. Now I would love to find out, do I have any food preservers in the audience? Has anyone ever done any food preservation? Okay. When I say canning, is anyone a little scared? Do you feel like if I can something, I'm going to kill my neighborhood? You know, I'm going to poison everyone I know because I'm going to cultivate a deadly neurotoxin in my basement and share it with my friends and family. And then two weeks later, I'm not going to have any friends and family left. Like, typically, that is the reaction that, you know, people have one of two reactions when I tell them I teach people how to can and preserve. Either they are very excited because that is something their grandmother used to do or they know how to do it, or they're terrified that they're going to wipe out, you know, half of South Philadelphia. So um, not to get too deep in the science, but for me, the science of canning and preserving is part of what makes it so interesting because it is both a science and an art. Um, is that as canners, the thing we're really concerned with is botulism spores. Like everybody is concerned about botulism, but what you don't really know is that when you're canning food, when you're preserving food, you're concerned about botulism spores, not about the botulism toxin. Because the botulism spores are what live in our soil and they are completely inert until you do a few things to them. One, you lock them into an oxygen-free environment. Two, you store that oxygen-free oxygen-free environment at room temperature, and then three, you ensure that that oxygen-free room temperature environment is very low in acid. So anytime we can something, we are creating an oxygen-free environment. Um, we're using the essentially the physics of our planet to vent out the oxygen in the jars, which then um, helps both remove any bacteria that might be present, but also the oxygen will degrade the food. So if you remove it, your food will last longer. So we're already creating that environment. And then two, when you can something, the whole point is to store it at room temperature, right? Like that's the thing. You don't want to be spending a lot of energy to keep it good. So you get it out of the fr fridge and freezer and move it to the pantry where you are storing it at room temperature. So that third issue, that acid question, then becomes very important. Um, so as long as you have plenty of acid in a jar, botulism spores cannot germinate. It inhibits them completely. And so you will never have an outbreak of botulism in a high acid product. And so that's most of your jams and jellies and pickles and chutneys and things like that. There are some fruits that, uh, most fruits are high in acid, but there are some that need a little extra um, acid to help ensure that that environment is high enough in acid to prevent those botulism spores from germinating. And those are things like white peaches, white nectarines, figs, Asian pears, melons, um, tropical fruits like mangoes and papayas, and tomatoes. Now, and tomatoes are a really interesting case because we think of the modern tomato, we think of tomatoes as being really acidic, right? Like you think tomato, you think acid. But um, the modern tomato, the one that we kind of has come to market in the last 60 to 70 years, has actually been bred to be less acidic and sweeter than tomatoes used to be. And so um, and the reason for that is we as North Americans have a sweet tooth and tomato breeders have responded to that sweet tooth by creating strains of tomatoes that are less acidic and sweeter. What this means in practice is that techniques and styles of food preservation that once were safe are not anymore. And so, um, you know, I often tell people that if you're still canning out of your grandmother's cookbook, it's time to update your material um, because that's not going to be particularly safe. So, um, and again, not to dive too deep into the science of it, but the way we measure acid content in preserved foods is by measuring pH. And so you kind of have to fling yourself back to high school chemistry class and think about how, you know, or if you've ever had to like monitor a swimming pool, you know, you think about like the um, pH of the swimming pool. Um, you need the acid content, the pH level of a contents of a jar to be, uh, have a pH of 4.6 or below, and that's considered high in acid. Now, most of the time, the best thing for canners to do is not to worry about the actual taking of the pH of a, con of a jar, but instead follow recipes from reliable sources. But it's always useful to have that information because you can go online and find pH charts that will tell you the average pH range of a particular kind of, kind of fruit. And then you can say, oh, is this fruit going to be in the range that I need it to be? It is. So I, I have gotten pretty deep in the science of this. Sorry about that. See, I'm not advanced. OK, you guys, someone needs to say something. Here, we'll get to, yeah, absolutely. Who's got a question? Yeah. It's odorless and just like separate. 
that is the pro yeah. So that is the problem with botulism. Botulism, the botulism toxin, is um, anaerobic. It is odorless and tasteless, um, and so you can't tell that it's there. There's no test to see if it's there. Um, and the other problem is those botulism spores. Unlike most other microorganisms um, that exist in in our world, the botulism spores aren't killed at the boiling point. And so, like everything else, just about everything else, you can boil the heck out of, and it's going to be sterilized, right? But Botulism spores are the one exception. You have to, if you can't inhibit them with enough acid, you have to employ a pressure canner to at, be able to elevate the temperature of the pot to around 250 degrees. And that's how you kill botulism spores. And so, um, you know, it used to be really complicated to explain um, pressure canning to people. And then suddenly the Instant Pot showed up and now everybody understands <laughs> cooking under pressure. So um, it's much more useful. But. Um, yeah, so that's, that's why you've got to be careful with botulism, spores and botulism, and why you have to do so much thinking ahead of time to ensure that you're preventing it. Now, if you make a strawberry jam, and strawberries are in season right now, so I highly encourage that you do that, um, you don't have to worry about botulism. Strawberries have a pH generally of between 3.2 and 3.8, so they're well below that 4.6 cutoff. You're never gonna poison anyone with strawberries. The biggest trouble you're gonna have with strawberries is that you might not get a jam that sets up because strawberries don't have a lot of pectin. Pectin is the fiber that holds up the cell walls of fruits and vegetables. So um, if something doesn't have a lot of pectin, and again, I, I don't mean to like dive down into like the crazy science behind this, but essentially here's what happens. Um, so when you make jam, you combine fruit and sugar. You boil that fruit and sugar. The water evaporates out of the fruit. The sugar starts to thicken um, as it elevates in temperature, as the water content reduces. And as the sugar thickens, it elevates in temperature to between 218 to 220 degrees. And at that point, it bonds with the pectin, either the pectin that's in the fruit, or you can also buy commercial pectin. And so that's why and how a few, um, so, but fruits that have more pectin naturally are gonna just be more um, amenable to setting up and creating a spreadable jam. Whereas strawberries, they don't have a whole lot of natural pectin, and so they don't like to set up very well. Um, that's not to say that a strawberry sauce isn't delicious, but if you're going for something you can actually spread on toast, it's a little bit harder to achieve with strawberries. I often recommend that um, a blueberry jam is an easier first project than strawberries. Um, yeah, so, whew, I've really, uh, gone deep here, forgive me. Let's see, more, more pretty pictures. Um, that, that is a pretty nice, those, those peaches look good. I'm ready for peach season, I have to say. Um, so when I, when I teach canning and preserving, one of the biggest things for me about it is it's not just teaching people a skill about food preservation. There is, it's almost like a, um, a therapy or a counseling endeavor in some ways because so many people come to food preservation with a sense of fear or anxiety. Fear that they're gonna kill someone, fear that they're gonna do it wrong, fear that um, it's just not gonna work. And so I often find that a big part of my job doing this work, doing, working in this world, is not just um, teaching the skills, but really helping people release their fears. Because if you're fearful, if you come to a class and you're fearful, it's a lot harder to learn and absorb the information. So, so much of what I do, it's like, I, sometimes I feel like I should bill myself as the um, food preservation counselor or the canning counselor as much as anything, because I feel like in order to let people open themselves up to the art of food preservation, they really have to work on releasing their fears around it first to be able to embrace it and feel comfortable and then find it fun. So, you know, I, so I've been doing this for 10 years now. Um, one of the interesting things that's happened is in the food pres preservation world, there have been trends. You wouldn't think like even in in canning and preserving that there would be things that were more trendy and less trendy, but there really are. We've moved away from just kind of straight ahead canning to more of a fermentation world. Um, we, in, here in Philadelphia, we have a really great fermentation teacher, so if anyone's interested, if you, you might know Amanda Pfeiffer, she's fantastic and um, does a lot of teaching in the area. So, you know, if, if you're looking for canning, I'm your girl. If you're looking for fermentation, Amanda is the person to reach out to. But. Um, it, it's interesting to see where we're going and where we're going next. Once the economy recovered, 
I really did notice a drop off in people looking for information about canning preserving. As there was more money in the system and less people feeling that sense of economic anxiety, fewer people turned to canning and preserving as a way of dealing with their anxiety and worries about um, what was going to come next. And so it'll be interesting to see like, how much, as I continue in this world, how much of you know, the world's interest in canning and preserving is related to the economy and economic fears and sense of anxiety um, more broadly in the culture. Um, I don't know. It's, I'm, I'm just going to watch it and see what happens. And yeah, I, but I still, I will, I, I'm going to kind of wrap up with this. I still love food preservation. I still love the act of canning and preserving. I really find it deeply satisfying. Um, and there's always something new to learn, which I appreciate. You know, in life, you've got to keep growing or you kind of feel stuck. And I have felt really lucky that over the last 10 years doing this work that I have had the opportunity to continue to grow and meet people and um, expand my knowledge base. And so I feel really fortunate. Um, does anybody have any questions about tomatoes? <laughs> um, anything I've said? I know this is probably a little different from your normal um, creative mornings. Most people don't get up here and talk about botulism. I could talk for hours about natural sweeteners and different kinds of pectin, but I won't. Um, but you know, if, you, if you're interested in more of that, let me know. Okay. All right, I think that's probably it, right? Okay. Thank you, guys.